for us right now. Father, thank you for the living word. You said you sent your word and it healed them. The word to preach is flowing like water. Holy Spirit, flow through me like living waters and feed your people today. Open ears, open hearts, change minds by the power of the word of God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You know, the Bible says that the word of God is settled forever in heaven. It's in the earth where there's a battle. And so I want to encourage you to believe the word of God. The Bible is not written by man. It was written by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit through human vessels. And it is the living word to you. It's a love letter from heaven. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the reality of that I'm, ex I'm, I'm experiencing and that I'm hearing from so many people, and that is the weariness of our current situation. Uh, you have the isolation factor, which is creating depression, um, uh, loneliness, disillusionment. The relational disconnection is not what we were designed for. We were designed for community. That's why being isolated is is a, one of the worst things that can happen to human beings. I have a friend that wrote a book about uh, the need for family. And I told him about our son Samuel, how he was born uh, in Vietnam. He was uh, two pounds when he was born. He had a huge hemangioma tumor on his face. And uh, his, his parents left him at the hospital in um, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, because they couldn't take care of him. His twin brother died. And so Sam was in an orphanage, and he was in an orphanage for 15 months, and he was just in a crib among hundreds of cribs. He was not uh, given affection. He wasn't hugged. He wasn't held. And so he was closed down, and uh, it, it took him. The, the, the specialist said he would never have a sense of humor. He wouldn't have a sense of compassion or empathy. And uh, guess what? We threw him in the mosh pit with all of our other kids, and within that family and that community, Sam has become one of the most beautiful human beings you would ever meet. He ended up being the prince of the sophomore class of his high school. And as we were walking across the football field at halftime, everybody in the stands stood up and they were clapping and they were applauding. They were shouting for Sam. He is such a beautiful kid. Great sense of humor. But you see, that's because a community, community brought Sam back to health. That's why isolation is so um, counterproductive to the human psyche. And then you have the threat of COVID. You have the loss of people having lost their businesses, people who have lost family members to COVID, uh, just the fear of COVID, weddings that have not been able to take place. People are so excited about their weddings. The weddings have been postponed, businesses that have gone under. You have the schools now shutting down. So this, you know, the community case that we're gonna be in isolation for a lot longer. Uh, the hopelessness of that, the financial hardships, the uh, political wars, the race relations that are worse than they've been in a long time. We, we were in such a great place and now we've been set back so far. It's so discouraging. So you wake up every morning. It's like Groundhog Day if you've seen that movie. And it's like you wake up and it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. And so some of you have grown really weary, tired, and you feel hopeless. And yet the Lord spoke to my heart a couple of months ago the phrase, let hope arise. See, God is not hopeless. It does not matter what is going on, what the situation is. God is never hopeless. In fact, the Bible calls him the God of hope. And he says the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you believe. That's the key phrase, to believe. And today what I want you to believe in is the power of his grace for you in your present situation. His grace is is real. It's tangible. It's not just a philosophy. It's not just scripture. It's not just an idea. It is, it is real. It is a substance. And so I want to talk to you today about three ways that grace changes everything. And so the key, well, I want to go right into it. Three ways that grace changes everything. All right, you ready for this? Number one, grace changes you. You think of Paul his name was Saul. Great example, best example in the entire Bible is Saul, who was transformed into Paul. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And his message was grace. 
And he says this profound passage. He says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Can you say that? That you are what you are by the grace of God? I'll tell you what. Any good thing about you, any good thing on our planet is by the grace of God. God has given you, he made you in his image. So any good parts of you came from God. That's God's grace. Now, some of you may not have a radical, life-changing, earth-shattering testimony like Saul who turned into Paul. But again, here's the reality. Sin breaks you. We're all broken. Our degrees, our measures are different, but we're all broken. We have all fallen from God's original design. That's why there's so much pain and suffering in the earth, because human beings hurt people, hurt people. We've all been hurt, and we all hurt one another. It's just part of our brokenness. But though sin breaks you, God's grace makes you. It restores you. It saves you and empowers you. That is the message. That's the entire message of the gospel. That's why it's called good news. And so this grace is so powerful that it took the number one persecutor of the Christian church in the first century. The guy who was doing, who was, who was ravaging the church. His whole mission in life was to crush the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was on his way to Damascus. You can read it in Acts chapter 9 to arrest some more Christians. And Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to him. And he saved Saul, changed his name to Paul. And Paul then went to the next town, not to arrest Christians, but to preach the gospel. And guess what? Because the church was so terrified of Paul, they did not believe. They thought it was a trick. And so here we read this in the book of Acts. And it says this, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 26 through 28. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem which is the headquarters of the church, he attempted to introduce himself to the fellowship of the believers. But everyone was afraid of him because they doubted he was a true disciple. Barnabas came to his defense and brought him before the apostles. Saul shared with them his supernatural experience. See, that's what Christianity is. It is not a religion. It is not a, a, a uh, philosophy. It's not an idea. It's not just theology. Christianity is a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ. That's why when people say that, you know, Christianity doesn't work or didn't work for me, or I grew up in the church and, you know, I, I, well, then you probably never met Jesus because you can't meet Jesus and say it didn't work. See, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when people try to refute Christianity, I always say, well, what are you going to do with Saul? What are you going to do with the Apostle Paul? This is a very intellectual man. I mean, talking about intellectuals, he was the cream of the crop. Powerful, wealthy, influential, intellectual, and he was crushing the church. Then he all of a sudden becomes not the number one persecutor of the church, but the number one leader of the church. How does that happen to a human being? Well, Paul explains it. He says he shared with them his supernatural experience of seeing the Lord, who spoke with him on the road to Damascus. Barnabas also told them how boldly Saul preached throughout the city in Jesus' mighty name. Then they accepted him as a brother, and he remained with them, joining them wherever they went in Jerusalem, boldly preaching in the power of the authority of Jesus. This grace transformed my life. This grace transformed my father's life. I'd, I'd, I would pray for my dad, and I would say to Jesus, I'm praying for my dad, Jesus, because I know I'm supposed to, but I have no faith he's going to get saved. And the day that he and I were standing in church together with our hands raised, worshiping Jesus, and I looked up at him, well, down at him, actually, because I was taller. I looked down at him, and he was raising his hands and worshiping Jesus. I just, whoo! That was the day that I realized and I knew nobody's too far from God for him to reach them. What about you? How has God's grace changed you? Again, maybe you don't have some earth-shattering testimony. You actually have the best testimony where you have not had to be rescued from brokenness and destruction and addictions and all that. But here's the truth. 
God's grace is not just a one-time, one-momentary experience. God's grace, His changing grace, is changing you every day, no matter where you start from, because we all were born in sin, and we're all broken, and, and we're so far from being like Jesus. I remember one time, way early on in my walk with the Lord, the Lord spoke to me, and He said, you despise weakness. I'm easily touched by it. <laughs> oh, my God. Woo! Oh, sometimes we can think we're so spiritual and then the Lord speaks to you and shows you where he's at and where you're at on the timeline, on your journey. And uh, boy, that transformed me and uh, broke my heart. And uh, next week I'm going to be teaching on that, how to have grace for one another. Because the more grace you give, the more grace you get. Jesus resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. But no matter where you are on your spiritual journey becoming like Christ, you're not Jesus yet. And so he's working on you every day of your life. And he will never, ever, I want you to hear this. This is for somebody. He will never, ever give up on you. Look at this scripture says. And I am certain that God who began the good work in you began, he began the work and it's a Good work. Everybody say good work. Good work. Say it again. Good work. Good work. The work that God's doing in you is a good work. He's transforming you into the image of his son. That Jesus' love will be your love. His peace will be your peace. His faithfulness be your faithfulness. His faith, your faith. His wisdom, your wisdom. His strength, your strength. That's what's happening inside of you. So look, during this COVID time, people have been telling about some of their ugliness coming up and coming out. And I say, good. I say, what do you mean good? I say, it was always in there. You're just being squeezed right now. And your unchristlike parts of your nature and character and fallenness is coming to the surface. And you're able to present that to God. And God's able to just scrape it off like he does as you put gold into a furnace. And then the infirmities of the gold rise to the top because of the heat. And then they, they scrape off the infirmities until that gold is so pure you can see through it. That's what God's doing with you. So be encouraged. Some of that nasty comes up. Just say, well, that's God just getting it out of me. Amen? All right. If you're there with your spouse, just turn to your spouse and look and say, amen. God's working on you. Praise the Lord. All the time. Uh-huh. And I'm certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it finally is finished on the day that Jesus Christ Jesus returns. You know, this, this uh, image I want you to capture of how God's restoring you. I was speaking to a member of our church this week who uh, does carpentry as a hobby. His name's Gary. And uh, he, he and I were talking yesterday and he told me about this chair that he built. He told me he has spent about 500 hours on this. He got the model from a guy who has one of his cha chairs in the Smithsonian Institute. Smithsonian. Smithsonian. Okay, thank you. That's why it's always good to have a choir with you. All right. Uh-huh. Get it up. That was part of my infirmity, my speech impediment coming out. Thank you, Lord, for giving me clear speech. And two presidents have bought his chairs. Not Gary's, but this guy. But Gary was modeling himself after this, this guy's um, uh, um, designs. And because of COVID, he was able to spend more time. But check this out. Here's the before picture. These are just the planks of wood that he started with, right? That's you before you meet Jesus. You're just material, right? Just dust. And then look what he transformed it into. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that gorgeous? Look at look at the design. Look at the look. Go to the next picture. Look at the intricacy down here. He even shows me this. Why? Because he spent so much time on every part until it just became this beautiful, beautiful chair, right? And so God does the same thing with you. He takes you just as you are. Look, God loves you just as you are. I want everybody here in this house. I want everybody in your home to hear this. God loves you. Just as you are. But, everybody say but. but. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Alright? He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Because he's transforming you into the image of his son. Just like this wood is transformed into a beautiful chair. Great job, Gary. You're under construction, but the master carpenter is fashioning and forming you. Especially during covid what is God saying to you during this time? What is he working on in you? 
He's changing you into something more beautiful. Have hope. Let hope arise as you're seeing these infirmities come to the surface. Even in your family. When your family is quarantined together and some of your relationships, they're, 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 the, the sparks are flying. Guess what that is? That's the infirmities coming to the top. Your family's getting healed. Your marriage is getting healed. It may seem bad, but it's actually getting better because God is at work in your marriage, in your family, and in you. He's also at work in our world. He's purifying the injustices of our world and the unrighteousness of our world. That's what he's doing. He's purging and purifying us. Wow. That's what's happening. Now, some of you may feel like, well, I just can't go on. I want to say, yes, you can. Because the second thing grace does, one, God's grace changes you. Number two, it empowers you. Every day when I wake up, I think to myself, I wake up and I was like, oh, God. That's how I feel. I don't know about you, but every morning I wake up, I'm like, oh, God. I just want to sleep just a little bit longer. But then my mind starts racing about all the things that have to be done. And the fact we're facing COVID again, I got a house full of kids that have needs and our family and the schooling situation, my wife's situation and our 400 pets we have in the house and the garden I built for my wife and the grass is dying. I got to tend to that. I mean, it just, you know, just hits me, right? But look what Paul says. This is the rest of that verse. I am what I am by the grace of God. Look what else. Look at the fullness of the scripture. But God's amazing grace. Everybody say amazing grace. Amazing grace. It's right here in the Bible. It's called amazing grace. It's not just a song. But God's amazing grace has made me who I am. Now watch this. And his grace to me was not fruitless. In fact, I worked harder than all the rest. Yet not in my own strength. Pastor Josh, say, not in my own strength. Not in my own strength. You know that to be true, huh? <laughs> yeah. You lean on that grace, man. Mm -hmm. Look, Paul says his grace to me was not in vain. That means it's an actual substance. It wasn't empty. It wasn't fruitless. But I worked. See, grace gives you the ability to work. Work is a godly thing. Work was in the garden before Adam and Eve fell. Work is not part of the fallen world. It's not sin. Work is a godly thing. God designed you to work. That's why when we're out of work, we're miserable. God has designed us to produce, to create, to innovate, to think. And the church should be on the cutting edge of everything. Media, technology, relationships, everything, man. The church should be leading the way in the earth because we have the creativity, the wisdom, the presence, the power of Almighty God, the Creator. So Paul says... His grace to me was not in vain. I worked harder than all the rest, yet not in my own strength, but God's. For his empowering grace is poured out upon me. You know, this grace is a supernatural energy. You say, well, how do I tap into this grace? Two ways. How do I tap into this grace? One, how do I activate it? No, you already have it. Now, I know that just sounds weak, but it's not. It's the starting point. You know, it's like somebody who has inherited millions and millions of dollars and they don't know about it. They feel broke, but they're not. They just lack information. God's grace is abundant. He's got more than you need. You know, my eyesight, you know, I just started needing reading glasses. I denied it as long as I could. But one night I'm laying in bed with hope and I'm reading and I got the Bible all the way out here like this. She says, uh, do you need glasses? I said, no. Why? Why would you, why would you ask that? You know, I'm going like this. I finally gave in and bought myself a pair of reading glasses, right? But I would leave them in a room and I couldn't find them or leave them in my car. I'm walking, where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? So a friend of mine, Mark Calversmith on staff here at the church. He said, listen, what you need to do is you need to buy one for every room. So I bought a bunch of reading glasses. And literally, the other day, I came walking into the living room like this. I was looking for my glasses, and I literally had three pair stuck in my shirt. Now, is that stupid? <laughs> More than enough. One time, I did this. I had a pair like this, and I took these off, and I went like this trying to put them on when I already had a pair on. Just silliness. I have more than enough glasses. You have more than enough grace. Mm -hmm. 
But you got to know you have it. When I wake up and I feel weary and tired, discouraged, depressed, anxious, whatever it might be, because I know what I'm talking to you about right now, I know that I have the grace of God, immediately I can tap into it. Like, oh, I'm not on my own. God's grace is with me. You all have the exact same grace that I do if you're in Christ Jesus. Paul said his grace has been poured out on me. Well, what's the next step? Once you know, you got to put it on. You got to use it. You got to step out and do the thing that you don't think you can do. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your relationships. Don't give up on believing God for your finances. Don't give up on your parents. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on the assignment that God has for you. Don't give up on what's right in front of your hand. That book that you're writing, don't give up on that. What is it that God's called you to do? You don't think, I can't do this anymore. Even if it's just living another day. Some of you are really battling. You really don't think you can make it another day. With God's grace, you can make it more than another day. It is supernatural. This is my point. The church should be the most vibrant people on the planet. Because, look, it's not just energy for today. It is, it is power for the hardest times of your life. That means right now we are experiencing more grace than we ever had because we need it. You know, my family and I just went to Yosemite. And uh, I tell you, Belle and I decided we were going to go up to Nevada Falls, which is a seven-mile round trip straight up. Here's a picture of the stairs we had to climb. 600 stairs. I literally ended up, now here's the thing. That railing, that was only for a really tiny part of the stairs. Yet my daughter decided that that's the picture she wanted to take. There's another one of me holding onto the railing. I was thankful for the railing, but that really was cheap because there was only like maybe 50 stairs that had a railing. The other 550 didn't. I literally ended up on all fours crawling up in front of people. I didn't care, man. It was hard. It's the hardest hike I've ever done. Of course, here's Bella, and here she's uh, right up, right up, right about here, and she's like waiting for the old man, right? She's all spry and spunky and ready to go, and I'm like crawling up on all fours. But here, look at this. Here's the thing. I didn't give up. Made it to the top. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Well, I forgot the picture of me making it to the top. I made it. I promise you. I was on Facebook Live. Some of you saw me. Yeah, right. These are my three daughters. <laughs> These are my three daughters. That's Half Dome behind them. And uh, they did some great hiking themselves. And then here's another one that's great. Sam and Josiah, man. And talk about it. Josiah and I, Josiah's in a wheelchair. And my family said, you guys got to wait back at the car. We waited for about two minutes. We said, forget this. And we literally hiked to, uh, what was it? Taft. Taft. I'm telling you, it is not wheelchair accessible and Josiah crawled most of the way I carried his wheelchair on the way back I needed my son Elliot and Bella to help me carrying the wheelchair and I remember Josiah was such a trooper I'm telling you it made me think about the fact that we were able to do what seemed impossible I, I tell you nobody has ever in a wheelchair done that hike the tax so those of you who have done it I know right now you can't believe we did it I couldn't either it was one of the hardest things we've ever done in our entire lives. It makes me think about how with God's grace, God's empowerment, you can do anything. The scripture says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Look at this scripture. This is the Apostle Paul talking about a, the most trying time in his life concerning this thing. It was something that was so overwhelming him, so painful so taxing that he pleaded with Jesus, please take this away from me. Three times he went to the Lord. The Apostle Paul, who got caught up to the third heavens, who raised the dead, healed the sick all over the place. He struggled. Your struggle, look, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means you're human. And you have an enemy called the devil who is attacking you. But you got to know you have the grace of God. Jesus said Satan comes immediately, and I used to live afraid that Satan was going to come and attack me. And the Lord spoke to me one day and said, you have more faith in Satan coming after you than me giving you the grace to overcome his attack. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you know when you get words from God, because that's too good for me to come up with. That, that changed me forever. 
No longer am I afraid of Satan's attack because I have trust that God will give me the grace to overcome his attack. That's exactly what was happening with Paul here. Satan, it says that Satan came to buffet Paul. And Paul turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, take this away. Jesus, take this away. Jesus, take this away. Jesus didn't take it away. Sometimes God will not take you out of your situation immediately. It's not a way out. It's a way through. And that's what grace is for. Empowering grace. And look what Paul writes. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he might depart from me. And he said to me, everybody say it out loud. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength. You see that? Jesus interchanges the word grace with strength. Boom. Strength. God's grace is strength for you. I want you encouraged today. Get up off that mat. Stand up. You can keep going and not just survive, but thrive because of God's grace. Look what Paul says. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's the exchange. You don't focus on your weakness. You focus on his strength. He gives it to you. It's supernatural. So Paul then says, Therefore, I'm most glad that I would rather boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, some of you would rather just do it on your own. And I'm telling you, that's just called pride. You say, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't need God's grace. Yeah, you really do. And it's not until you fall on your face over and over and over again, you're going to come to the place where you realize you do. Look, would you rather have in life just what you can produce or what you can produce plus what God adds on to you? Tell you, for me and my family, I'm like, God, I need a lot more for my family and for your church and for this world than what I can produce on my own. And then God flows through you supernaturally. You produce so much more with God's grace. But if you give up, that becomes your new reality. You quit on your marriage, that becomes your new reality. Quit on whatever project God has in front of you, your relationships, your businesses, our country, whatever you're involved in, you quit that becomes your new reality. But if you depend on God's grace and he gives you a supernatural attitude, supernatural wisdom, supernatural strength, and you go on, that becomes your new reality and God gets glory. Thirdly and finally, great God's grace not only changes you and empowers you, God's grace gifts you. Did you know that? That you've been gifted by the grace of God, especially when you come to Christ Jesus. First, you've been gifted by God, graced by and simply by being made in his image. And you have certain attributes and abilities. You're, you're an engineer or you're a teacher or whatever your gift and grace might be. You have compassion. That's God's nature. That's God's grace. He made you in his image. But then you come to Christ and he fills you with his Holy Spirit. He gives you supernatural abilities. And he done, he's given these to you so that you can use them to help and benefit others, especially right now in the time of COVID. Now, some of you don't know what your gifts are. You can go to our website, gatheringplacechurch.org. Go all the way to the bottom of any page and you'll see resources. Click on that and you'll see a spiritual gifts test. It's a 140 question test that you can take and then there's a little, um, there's a little uh, answer sheet and you can discover how God has graced you, what gifts you have. He gave them to you specifically for you to use them to benefit others. I have, I've talked to people and they say, oh, you know, I'm bored. You know, church is boring. Christianity is boring. Well, you know why? Because you're not doing anything. You're not using the gifts and the graces God's given to you. I'm not bored, but every day I'm online giving you an encouraging word. I'm in the word every day to teach. That's part of my gift to encourage you. I'm here on Sunday mornings. I'm doing Zoom meetings with people all week long. Using my gifts to hopefully help people. I have found that people that are bored on their spiritual walk, they are not stepping out and helping anybody. They're like the Dead Sea. Have you ever seen the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea is in uh, Israel, and it is a salt sea. It's a sea that is nothing but salt, and nothing lives in it. You know why? It's a lake. It's called the Salt Sea. It's a lake. It's not a river. The Bible says, you don't have to go there. The Bible says, you got it? Okay. The Bible says that rivers of living water flow out of you. Those are your spiritual gifts that benefit others. But if you're not allowing God to use you to benefit others, you become a lake. You become stagnant. 
and you become the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in it. No fish live in it. There it is. That's the Dead Sea. If you're not doing anything, that's what you look like. I'm telling you, I'm not trying to be mean. It's one of the reasons you're dealing with depression and fear and anxiety and discouragement and disillusionment. Who are you encouraging? Who are you praying for? Who are you blessing? You see, in fact, the Dead Sea is starting to die and they're having to figure out how they're, how they're going to resuscitate it, how, they're going to, how it's going to survive. That's what God's doing with you. I'm telling you, the key is to step out of yourself and help someone else. That river will start flowing. Look at the scripture say about this. We're going to have to come to a close. Every believer, the scripture says, has received grace gifts. Grace gifts. Every believer has received grace gifts. So use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the multicolored tapestry of God's grace. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Christ has given us, each of us, special abilities. You have special abilities. And the purpose is to be a blessing to others. Ephesians 2, 10 says, God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to do living our lives. You know, if you're on a sports team and you're sitting on the bench and somebody comes up to you and says, how are you enjoying, you know, being on this team? Uh, I'm kind of bored. But if all you're doing is sitting on the bench, no wonder you're not enjoying it. you got to get in the game. That's when it gets fun. 1 Corinthians 12 says this, The Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping the entire church. And 1 Peter says this, God's marvelous, um, Romans 12 says this, God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. It's uniquely yours. Sam, Josiah, Lily, Ava, Bella, Hope, Josh, me, you, every single one of us have unique gifts. Even if you have the same gifts as someone else, they're not you. You have a unique gift, a unique voice, a unique ability. It says each of us has been given unique gifts. So, if God has given you the grace gift of prophecy, you must activate your gift by using the proportion of faith given to you to prophesy. If your grace, you have the grace gift of serving, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, then be actively teaching and training others. If you have the grace gift of encouragement, then use it often to encourage others. If you have the grace gift of giving to meet the needs of others, then may you prosper in your generosity without fanfare. If you have the grace gift of leadership, be passionate about your leadership. And if you have the grace gift of showing compassion, then flourish in your cheerful display of compassion. Those of you who are gifted to lead need to lead like never before. Those of you who have the gift of mercy, show compassion like never before. Those of you who have the gift of giving, give more now than you ever have before. Those of you who have the gift of encouragement or teaching or evangelism or prophecy or meeting practical needs, right now during this COVID, you need to do, you need to utilize your gift more than you ever have before. Not only will it break your depression, God will flow through you and you'll become part of the answer to our current situation. Now here's some examples some people sent in to me and I'm going to close with these stories of people in our body who've been stepping out, stepping outside of themselves. I'm going to tell you something. When you get outside of yourself, it's a game changer. There's the salt sea again. You can go forward again. When you go outside of yourself, it's a game changer. I usually jump ahead of my notes. It's not my tech team's fault. It's my fault. You got to get outside of yourself. This is for someone. This is for many of you right now. Get outside of yourself. Don't, don't think about your needs. Think about somebody else's. I'm telling you. When, when Jesus saw a hillside of thousands of people who were hungry, they only had a few fish and a couple loaves. Like, what can I do with all this? What can I do with this? I can't do anything with what I have. I'm so small and tiny and insignificant. Jesus said, give it to me. Give Jesus what you have. Give him who you are. Then he multiplied it and fed the multitudes. But guess what? It flowed through the disciples' hands. They're the ones who are passing out the miracle. And then there were 12 basketfuls left over. How many disciples were there? 12. When you get in the game, God's going to flow through you. You're going to have more than enough. Here's some stories. Shell in our church says, every time we see someone, a stranger or someone we know, 
We ask them how they're really doing and we listen. It's amazing what people have shared, supporting people by listening. We've arranged introductions via Zoom and phone and email to people who aren't connected. We've written cards, we've text scriptures and pictures, encouraging YouTube links, funny stories and graphics, arranging volunteers to help with food for low-income families. And we have, arranged, we have made arrangements with the food bank and other donors. Thank you, Shell, for stepping out of yourself and being an answer. Chris says this, Chris uh, Larkin, had a Zoom call with a C-19 positive patient who was high risk in the hospital on oxygen. Boy, that was a lifeline for that person. Called a brother and prayed and shared testimonies of God speaking and encouraging him. The youth team went to the graduating seniors' homes and gave college baskets full of gifts, surprising them. He said, that I took care of my mother after surgery when she was practically blind for a few days while working on my laptop. So he worked from her place on his laptop, took care of his mom and did his job at the same time. Reached out to a family in our church that had a newborn baby, uh, that Rachel, the, the grown adults, that Rachel, his wife, who's a cardiac sonographer, was able to scan and minister to while physically being there when the loved ones could not. So the grandparents couldn't be in the hospital when the granddaughter was in the hospital. But check it out. Rachel, who also is a member of our church, Chris's wife, she is a sonographer. And she was in the hospital. And this is her testimony. I was not scheduled to be in the NICU uh, that day. But as soon as I saw Amaya's name, I swapped shifts with the co-worker so I could help the grown adults. Isn't that beautiful? What a, what a gift for the grown adults. She said, also, I received a call from Stephanie DeBain, who simply wanted to check in on me to see how I was doing, working on the front lines at the hospital during COVID. It seems so simple, but in this time, a phone call means a lot. Chris Sheridan says this, the ways I've been reaching out and trying to bless people during this time has been to help people move. Reaching out to members of our men's group, connect with, connect with texts and phone calls, engaging in thoughtful discussions on social media, and always praying for the members of our church, the pastor, his family, the leadership for our country. And me and my son, we saw our neighbor digging a bunch of trenches over in his yard and to lay, lay pipe, and he was doing it all by himself. And I said, boys, let's go. And we went over there and helped dig trenches filling in his trenches. We did social distancing. He had so many trenches to fill. He was out there by himself. I got teenagers in my house. We went over there for multiple days in the heat, but we helped our neighbor with something very practical, but we were able to social distance. It meant so much to him. It meant so much to us. You've got to get outside of yourself. The grace of God is all over you to change you, to empower you, and to grace you to help others. That's how you'll experience God during COVID, and that's how the church will be the answer to the world. Amen? Amen. All right, Pastor Josh is going to come up. He's going to lead us in a closing song. But I pray from this day forward, you'll always know that the grace of God is on you to do supernatural things. God bless. Amen. Oh, the Word of God is powerful. Amen. Amen. As John was <clears throat> talking, was, uh, this next song I was going to go into is just kind of a confirmation of how powerful the Word of God is. In Isaiah 55, 10, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is my word, God's word, that goes out from my mouth. It will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose, the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God has been spoken today. Let it produce in your life, for it gives God glory when you are fruitful. Amen? Jesus even said, it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit.
Receive it today.